I don't know about you, but Fridays seem to be coming around fast and thick at the moment. So I ask you, will you be nerding for the weekend? It's an incredible lineup today. Rupert Gregson Williams, not only a total A list legend, but also a great friend and someone who's been pivotal in my career, is going to join us to talk about the future of Hollywood, his relationship with samples, of course, our film of the week, Raging Bull, and a piece of Benjamin Britten, a composer he has a mixed relationship with. Anna Phoebe will also be joining us again for her opinions, but first... Hello everyone, it's Kellen, and I want to see what you've been up to this week. Kyle from Southpaw Shorts returns to show us his first attempt at creating the box for his analog music box. And Casio is celebrating an impressive 40 years of making musical instruments with a composition that spans the history of their gear. Check out those videos, linked below, and keep showing us your inner nerd with the handle nerding for the weekend. Whilst many of these efforts are valiant, there's one I really wanted to highlight this week. I mentioned it last week. This popped up on a social feed. A fantastic composer is about to really change shit up, and I'm really excited about it. It's a real honour to welcome you here today, a Miss Jo Ranger. Hi, Christian. So you're based just southwest of London. How is lockdown treating you down there? Lockdown's been... It, it, it's all right. Um, in some ways, work has, you know, dried up, but then you have more time to do other work to try a variety of new things. So it's... Um, in some ways, it's been really wonderful for, for my creative practice and getting into a, a really good, yeah, creative flow. So as I mentioned before on one of Joe's social media feeds, something really piqued my interest. Joe, could you take us through this amazing thing that you're setting up yeah we're, uh, we're setting up something called um audio artemis um it's basically to to give women and other marginalized genders um in the media music community um a voice when it comes to um to audio sampling and um sample based instruments it's so easy to you know look at spitfire and other companies and wonderful and you know it's it's full of men really, really the face of it is is full of men <laughs> <laughs> in the nicest possible way um, and for whatever uh, reason but um, it, it can just get a bit disheartening really when you're not really seeing anyone like you. It's a place where women and other marginalised genders are going to be able to sell products to share for free other products um, and um, to support others um, in their sampling and scripting um, journeys really. You know, I'm really proud of the gender mix that we have at Spitfire Audio. It's it's largely 50-50, kind of maybe not quite there, but close. Um, the number of Spitfire users who are uh, female, the number of people who watch my channel, it's absolutely shocking. And Paul and I, between us, we have, I believe, seven daughters, eight children in all, seven daughters. And the idea that creation of sound or indeed computer production, electronic orchestration, wasn't something they could consider as a legitimate career choice is simply horrifying to us. Yeah, I mean, um, certainly I think women and other people who can, in their minds, know that, you know, I know that I'm not excluded from this, I know that I'm perfectly welcome, but if you don't see that on screen, you don't see other people like you doing that and, and getting seeing them in every stage of the process, really doing that and putting their work out there, um, it's perhaps not going to twig and you're just going to think, oh, well, I, I know that it's I'm welcome in it, but I'm not going to be able to compete with those big boys. I'm not going to be able to, to do that um, like they can do it. But it, yeah, Audio Artemis is, is going to try and try and do something about that to really show other other women, other people, people of other marginalised genders that we can compete with the big boys, we can make things that people really want to, to use in their work to, to, to buy and share and, and, um, and we can develop in, this, um, in our sampling journey just like, just like the men can. Um, if you consider yourself a woman or another marginalised gender, you can sign up to be a member or even a vendor. Um, members can um, contribute to the forums and support other members um, and as a vendor you get to do that and you also get to share and sell products 
Um, if you don't fall under that category, you can still go there. You can still, um, when the products are up there, um, download them, buy them, um, and read the forums as well if there's any support there that can be helpful. So, um, but other than that, just to share it. Well, I'm excited on many grounds, Joe. not only as a father, but also as a fellow developer, but most of all, as a composer. So do link through and shout about it as best as you can. Best of luck with that, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. But not to fear, if you don't fancy saving the world this weekend, we also have a, a bevy of free instruments to talk to you about in this week's Piano Drop. So stick around for that. So Nerding for the Weekend, this is our sixth episode and it was set up in response to uh, lockdown, uh, a place to come for free sounds, inspiration or just best part of an hour's worth of a few people waffling on about sampling and composing and films. And we will get on to that in a moment. But I guess for all of us, there's a sense of things slowly being unlocked and we'll possibly face a brave new world. Are we going to learn anything from lockdown, take anything with us? So it's a real pleasure to welcome back uh, an absolute rising star of the composing fraternity, but also an inspirational and virtuosic violinist and a very good friend, Miss Anna Phoebe. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good. I feel like the world once again has changed irrevocably like with uh, with your new haircut I just we had to just go right down to the the very uh, the, the root I core of, great. of my no oh, thank you that's very kind very kind indeed she can come and do my fringe because my i try to do my fringe <laughs> it's like these, these covid haircuts are going to get quite experimental i think down south you're unlocking a couple of weeks earlier than we are up here in scotland are you thinking about life beyond this particular weird time. I remember you doing that, you know, at the Spitfire Audio day that you did at King's Place, and you did this, um, I think it was a it was a panel with um, Nitin Sawney and Michael Price. Price. And I remember there was a question from someone who'd flown down from Glasgow saying, like, for film and TV, you know, do I have to be in London or can I be? And I remember sort of unanimous across, across the panel was saying, well, actually, you have to go where the work is. That's LA, London. And I wonder if in the film or um, music to picture or artists, if, if there will be some sort of decentralisation and an acceptance that you don't have to be in cities. Because I know in other, my sister who works in fashion and publications, publishing, she's now thinking of spending more time down in Deal, just getting better broadband. And actually she's saying that the office culture won't go back to the way it was. So hope, I don't know, I don't know if that will also happen in you know, your line of work. Touring, obviously, you have to go where the gigs are. But so Sammy Andrews, who's also behind this broken record, fixed streaming kind of campaign, saying, you know, how are we going to get people back into a live scenario? Is it going to be literally one in every four tickets sold in a seated theatre? The cost yeah. of putting on a, on a production isn't going to be sustained by selling, by capping it to the 25%. And I think that what will happen is, is is creativity will come through and it won't be a, a practical solution. It will be one born, you know, someone thinking of something that, that is really beautiful and works on a human level, but is just a bit more. I go up to the top of Arthur's seat every morning and one of the things I love about it is actually walking down and I see all of the couples huddled around in and amongst the gorse, a little bit like hobbits, but just like these these heads of people drinking coffees and stuff. And it's just like, well, that that's kind of like a natural amphitheater for theatre and I think that we'll probably find a way but it won't be something that a minister. I think also you know speaking as someone who releases music as well like there's the whole campaign when you say about you know what is the future going to look like this whole broken record campaign which is being spearheaded by um, Tom Gray from um, from Gomez and then also Crispin Hunt, the Ivers, PRS, um, uh, Musicians Union have got behind it. It's kind of like, well, we know, we recognise the importance of music as part of our cultural, our, uh, as part of our culture. And it's about how do you ensure that if people can't create in the same way or be remunerated, i.e. travelling or touring, touring live, live productions, you know, let's fix the streaming and let's make sure that people are paid the, the correct royalties. That's a whole other conversation, but... But I think yeah, it is. No, no. I, I think it is about looking around for opportunities and how and how we want the future industry um, to look on a sort of a wider scale. And I think fixing streaming and taking on the giants like YouTube and Spotify is going to be one of those, or should be one of those. Right. Well, Anna, I hope you don't mind sticking around to talk about Raging Bull and the Sea Interludes by Benjamin Britten. But our next guest, whether it be 
Aquaman, Wonder Woman, The Bee Movie, Over the Hedge, a whole bevy of Adam Sandler movies, or indeed one of his many triple A TV scores, not to mention literally thousands of pieces of library and production music that he has supervised, produced and composed. It's very unlikely that you have escaped this man's musical reach. But also, to me, a friend, a mentor and someone who has been pivotal on a number of counts in my career as a composer and, I guess, also as a businessman. Mr. Rupert Gregson Williams. Thank you for having me. And you haven't changed a bit since the last time I saw you. Little less hair, a little bit. We've been talking about a beer for ages and things including coronavirus have conspired against us. But the last time we had a drink, it was totally uh, uh, coincidental that we just happened to be in New York the same afternoon and I was a few streets away and we had a beer in a hotel, I seem to remember. That's right, that's right. And you had an idea. I can't remember what the idea was, but you've always got an idea. <laughs> and uh, you wanted to tell me about it. So I got in the cab and, and heard the idea, I had a beer and thought it was a good idea. It might have even been Spitfire, that idea. I don't know if you understand how you are kind of the linchpin in the Spitfire story because Rupert has a library music production company. Is that a good description of Shake Up? We are a production company. We, we uh, have partners in EMI and Sony and, and various others. And you'd been so kind to give me loads and loads of work. And we had a, a hit, one of those library hits that you mentioned that happens from time to time. And it was in the time before I became a dad. And uh, it was that... Um, uh, money that went into seed fund uh, Spitfire. But it was also some of your, your guidance and some people that you introduced me to, namely your brother Harry, but also Hans. But I think that one of the things that I really remember you saying is the real problem with sample libraries is they're just too big and we don't always make big music. Well... Well, I'm very glad to have been just the tiniest, tiniest little part of of, of the process. I've got to say that, that your stuff is brilliant. And, and part of the reason why it is, is because when I'm writing, I want to write an inner line and I want it to be on four cellos or on six cellos. I don't want it to be on all 12 uh, while the other 12 and 12 and 12 were playing the harmonic business around it. So, so and so that's part of the reason why your stuff is so great you've 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 gone for the detail you listen to what i said at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> you're from a very musical background but you embrace technology you know you've been using samples for a number of years now rupert haven't you i've got to say right at the very beginning i did some samples for hands and talked to him a lot about them as we did them and he gave me his samples as we were going so i felt like i got a running jump at it right in using really good samples so i was, I was lucky uh, and uh, and i used them in anger and I'm sure that some of the jobs I got was because the demo sounded great, yeah. because the samples were great. Was it Symphony of Voices that you conducted and you did a kind of a little bit of a shout out at the end saying, please don't pirate this library or something like that? That's right. Yeah, yeah that was good. That was Eric Persing, uh, Spectrosonics guy. Yeah, yeah. Which actually it's all over Omnisphere. Now, I don't think me shouting is. I hope it's not. I haven't <laughs> come across it on Omnisphere. All those R's and U's. And the song to Susan the Arnu stays, which you heard endlessly in the sort of nineties TV, <laughs> you know, someone would die and Arnu will stay would come over the thing and, and that was that was us a consideration at the time was we were we all we only had seven sixties that had thirty two megs of memory. You'd have a string patch which should take two of them and that was sixty four meg of RAM. Wow. So you had to, a little bit more consideration of, of memory, you know. Of but also back in the day, Rupert, I, there was very much um, segmentation of what a composer composed for. So there was this perception of if you were a TV composer or if you were a film composer or if indeed you were a library music composer. And that's something that you've managed to kind of straddle successfully. Times have changed in that respect, have they not? They have. Um I mean, just in terms of, I mean, forgetting the library music for a moment, just looking at TV and movies, I mean, what are the most interesting, where's, where are the most inter interesting is being told? Most of them are on telly, as we know, you know. Um, so working on telly. By the way, I heard a score of yours the other night, which I loved. I thought it was great. Um, which one was that? Home. It's a nice series, The that. score of yours. I hope I'm just saying... No, yeah, no, that yeah, it is, lovely, it is. And yeah. a lovely score. I did a TV series that probably no one saw called The Alienist. A couple of years ago and i had as much fun if not as more fun than i've done on a movie because i had loads of time and, and loads and loads of suites that we wrote in advance and lots of recordings and then 
bring into the machine and use as weapons through the whole series. And that was really appealing because with a movie, often there's, there's just one deadline. I remember hearing Sam Mendes recently saying that there's no way he'd get American Beauty made these days for the cinema. It's just, for want of a better description, the middle class of cinema. It used to be you'd get these these low budget films, these you know blockbuster budget films, and then these you know twenty thirty million dollar, well fifteen million to thirty million dollar movies. Those don't really exist anymore. Is that right? The sort of movies that uh, that are getting well, who knows after lockdown. That's another. That's another conversation to be had, really, what, what's going to happen to us all after this. But, um, but yeah, the, the Marvel movies, the 100 to $200 million films are still going to be made or were up a few months ago. And the sort of movies that, that you know, Kevin Hart will, come, will wheel out and do or, um, you know, stars like that are still going to be, you know, Jumanji, I'm sure, was still a $100 million film. Yeah. But those 60, 70 million films that we've done, they they they're a bit of too much of a risk, aren't they? Really, because they don't have mega stars who to to to, to warrant the hundred million dollars um, to to bring the crowds. But I've got to say, it's all going to change now, anyway, isn't it, Christian? I mean, it's um, and we we touched on telly for a moment. I mean, it's you know, telly and Netflix are one thing; they're blended. Yes, it's going to be one blended family. Well, also what I'm noticing is uh, an, in, an increasing trend. I don't know how, how, if you're hearing any kind of overtures to, in this respect with Hollywood is of uh, productions getting green lit because they can isolate the crew and the cast and then uh, they can guarantee that all of the post-production can be done remotely. The studios still exist at the moment yeah. and they are going to try and find a way back into the business and if it means that they find a passport a wellness passport you know where you've they only they only uh, engage crew if it's going to be a hundred crew plus only those crew that, that walk around with a passport that say they've had it yeah you know they've got antibodies i mean it sounds ridiculous but i mean everything sounds ridiculous at the moment it sounds very 20 22nd century doesn't it yeah. to be walking around with a, a wellness um a bar tag on your on your wrist the podcaster joe rogan i noticed is basically he's still going but he's just he has a doctor in his podcasting studio who basically swabs everyone who appears on the podcast and you can throw a bit of money at these yeah. things eventually i guess yeah yeah and and people um, because they want it, they want to make those movies. I mean, I, I, it's going to be interesting to see how many you see this sort of reaction every couple of years. I know this is much more, this is a much larger issue that we're having, but you see it every couple of years where things react to to culture. And so maybe in a year or two's time, we'll see a lot more sort of two handers, you know, little sort of play like movies, movies that are just about couples, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sure it'll bring a, a, a really nice refreshing look to some movies but um but after but it, but it is a business and it's not about um, making it's not all about making indie movies and, and and art uh it's about making money for these for the big companies you know it's just as plain and simple as that so that they're working at trying to trying to get the big crews back in however they however they can do it. you touched on relationships you've had a series of hugely su successful relationships probably very notably with um, a huge number of uh, projects that you've worked on with Adam Sandler. Uh, what goes into a fantastic relationship, uh, Rupert? It's something that we're told that we must we must strive for as composers. Uh, well, trust, I think. I mean, first of all, um, knowing that you can, when someone opens their mouth and says something, they mean it. Or when they open their mouth, say something that the other person is, is if he doesn't understand it, is going to ask them to qualify what they just said that I'd say with Adam I mean Adam I'll tell him if it's I don't think it's funny he's not going to enjoy me telling him that but I'm gonna if he sort of says look you know you're gonna really have to help me with this with some music because because of the performance and I say well why don't we just not have it in the film um so we don't have to help it he's not gonna enjoy that but he but but really you know deep down that sort of a relationship is is valuable you know because it's all about the filmmaking well, I think also one forgets that he is uh, a stand-up comedian uh, originally. And what I find with just following many, you know, the podcasting stand-ups is that is they're very fascinated by the science of it, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Uh, I've worked with Jerry, I mean, talking comedians, Jerry Seinfeld, who was very obsessive about every single detail. And Adam is more sort of shoot from the hip uh, and gut instinct. So, you know, if he doesn't like it, he would probably admit he's not terribly good at describing why he doesn't like it or okay. why it's, but, but he'll say exactly what it's making him feel 
it's making me feel too sappy. I, I, I don't want to be a sappy idiot up there. I want to be this. So go away and re rewrite it. And it's kind of straightforward. Um, so he doesn't overthink things. And that that's rather good. I mean, talking about relationships, if you work with somebody who does over work, over, overwork their brain, that can be really tiring because you, you end up, uh, again, second guessing their their paranoias and their worries and uh, sure. we all know that when we worry about things we tend to look at the extremes in that direction and then the extremes in that direction so it's really tiring working with someone like that and you have to pin them down and and try and make them feel not worried yeah <laughs> don't keep on overthinking things and making wild suggestions since i started what 20 years ago what i have found is it's evident to me that for directors or or people in say Adam's position, people making the stuff, that that the post production process has become less linear and more stacked. So there are huge demands being made on the people that have to kind of feed back and make decisions. And the exposure that I have to the film or TV makers is that much more limited to what I remember it being. And is that not part of the relationship too, that being trusted to get on with it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I mean, it depends on the movie too. Uh, again, with you're talking about the stacking up of, 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 of things happening, especially towards the end of post-production. That happens in, in big uh, studio films, uh, especially uh, ones that have lots of people who want to have something to say. They'll say it towards the end of production. Plus, the last two reels have generally got a lot of CGI that are piling in. So you find a director is being torn. He's got to go and look at 45 CGI shots and he's got to come in and he's suddenly going to see some music he hasn't heard before underneath some visuals he hasn't seen before and so that can be quite scary for him so you have to manage that so for him to to him to have a composer who he trusts or he's had that conversation with and and who understands the story that's that's really helpful f for them um but uh, it's always going to be a new that the, the piling up of in the big movies with cgi and music tend to collide towards the end you know i've written large cues uh towards the end where i've just felt there are two people talking together on a on on a ledge when it's the cgi comes in the actual you see the the you know you see the the, the army in the background <laughs> coming to assault them you know so suddenly hang on a minute <laughs> things are slightly different it wasn't quite such an intimate condition so um those sort of things happen to everybody and 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 frighten the director the producers and everybody everybody's got notes and so you don't sleep much a question that I'm often asked by people who are, are breaking into uh, the industry is where you're geographically positioned and the need to move to LA, the need to move to London. I'm aware that you divide your time up between um, oceans. Um, uh, do you feel it is important to be in these central hubs, whether it be at the beginning or during your career or later in your career? Is, is that something that is, 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 is important? It's important to consider it. Um... It's interesting you ask that question because your sound to me today is has been getting increasingly worse and I can just about hear what you're asking. Uh, and that is because I'm out in the middle of nowhere in Sussex and not, not in a beautiful studio in uh, in Los Angeles. And that can be an issue, and actually an issue when I'm having a conversation with a director, I'll be speaking to them and then suddenly, oh shit, they've, they've, they've gone. And then we've reset, reset. And that wouldn't be an issue if I were in, uh, you know, in LA and talking to them. So, um, but, but going back to the question, it, in my, right at the beginning of my career, I worried about it a lot. And uh, my uh, friends and family and my mentor over their hands used to give me a lot of grief about being over here and say, you get over here. You know, what are you doing? If you're a, if you're a, country musician you just you don't move to ontario or vancouver you yeah. move to you know nashville so what are you doing what are you doing in sussex and that was a fair comment but i wanted to do it my way in the end it was the wrong way and so i, I moved to la and uh, and spent um a long time over there or a period of time over there until i got established and made some of those relationships and now i feel i feel uh you know i'm lucky enough to be the position where i can be open and honest about being here and i'm there for them if they want me but i'm here and this is where i feel comfortable and so i'm going to do my best work but i'm lucky in that position i don't think everybody can be in that and it's taken a while to to get there and sometimes it's you know the, the the answer will come back. Well, actually, I'm I would rather you would be were here so I can see you and we can 
be in the same room. And in that case, I'll just I'll go to, to LA and I'll I'll stay there as long as they want me to be there and so I can connect with them. Um so but I do think that at the beginning of of, of a career, it, it's gotta be really difficult phoning it in. It's got it's gotta be really difficult. I mean, unless you're extremely lucky and you 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 have a meeting and and the people say I don't care where you are. I don't see how you could be living in um you know in, in West West Island and get a need to do commercials in London. I mean, I, you you need to be in there, as you know, in conversations with these um, with these young guys who are young guys and girls who are making the commercials, don't you? I think the the, the thing that um, we shouldn't underestimate. Uh, I mentioned earlier about you being very much a part of my career. You've mentioned hands being part of yours. And that is that we we do kind of help each other out. And being around other composers is, you know, they're not they don't all live in West Wittering. They tend to congregate in hubs. So go where the composers are. That's right. Yes, exactly. Although I know a very good composer who lives in West Wittering, or actually in Bognor Regis. I too in Bognor Regis. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, you're right. And uh, well, now I've I, I, for my own personal selfish. <laughs> reasons i live in the south of england and i'm very happy to be here travel to, to the uk but my guys um when i'm fully on you know a, a, a big movie in a, t in a tv series or something um they are in you know one or two in the states and one or two um in one in london a couple along the south coast of england one in yeah. Bognor regis funny enough so um so yeah so so it doesn't really matter does it i mean as long as we all communicate and um i it's uh, it just di digressing a bit i mean if thinking of the the i know you've had um before you moved to edinburgh you you had a a, a room in a building which was kind of a community yes. um which sadly i never visited although i think i did the one before that and um, I certainly had, uh, when I was uh, living abroad, I'd have a, a group uh, of people working for me, three or four people. And that is great when you, ha when you connect with people every day. And it, you, there's something about, um, uh, there is something about your energy uh, that is dissipated to your crew. But then if you then become, you know, uh, a self-distanced composer like i naturally have become down mm -hmm. in the in the countryside in sussex it's really down to who you work with you know and i've got i have some a couple of really fabulous people who know me inside out and know all my foibles and my weaknesses and second guess me and we could be in the same building it makes no difference you know we get the same amount of work done and it's as good as it would be going back to um how you've helped me in the past um big part of um, uh, our work together was production music or, or, or library music. And I've been speaking to library music companies recently who say that uh, they've never had business like it. It is, it is both a really important part of our industry, but also, I would say, more respected now. And I think you're part of that story. Um, what are your thoughts on production music and its future? Well, it's definitely changed a lot since I started the company with Joe and uh you were writing for us mm -hmm. and uh it's it's changed a lot in its function um i mean back in those days they'd have walls of cds and it was really it must have been quite must have been a full-time job for a music editor to, to, to place the music now the quality is up and actually the quantity is up so i wouldn't say that the quality is necessarily up overall because yeah. of just by the sheer number of uh, weight of, of music um but uh music itself has changed you know it's about getting a left field piece of music and being able to use it intelligently and there's a lot of left field music out there in library whereas you know when you, we, you and i started we were talking about okay we'll do uh we've got to do some some drones but obviously and then we've got to do some some hip-hop that's happening right now uh, yeah. and all that but now i i find that we can get people to do more original material because then it's going to get the imagination going of the um of the filmmakers and the editors more they can because they're and maybe filmmaking is is cleverer now maybe people are always looking for something opposite they they don't want the obvious they don't want to they don't want to play um the emotion the same way that that it's actually playing on the screen you know and so that's helped a bit and and it's more fun to play to, to write i guess um i don't write so much myself anymore i used to write a fair amount in the days when you were writing yeah um with us but, but 
Um, but I can see the, our writers are having quite a lot of fun with some of the original stuff. Speaking candidly, that when I started doing it, it was a little bit, ha, 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 look what you're doing. You're doing library music. It, it, had, a, it had a kind of stigma attached to it, whereas now... I mean, I would say 80% of certainly factual entertainment, if not more, is library music, and it's much more respected within the composing community. Yeah, absolutely. And that's probably because, uh, you know, the, it, was in, it has and always been an invaluable way of people making a crust, uh, young up-and-coming composers to, to, to maybe um, practice their craft. I mean, um, and so those people are now, you know, what are we? We're veterans now. Mm -hmm. Christian, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, no. Uh, and uh, <laughs> but so the people who are, have come up and now have a career and are in their 30s and early 40s and what have you, um, they would have perhaps come up through writing writing it. And so there's you know it's respected because of that perhaps. Also, you know budgets are less on the factual programs you're talking about. I mean I don't know when the last time you wrote music for a factual program and got a budget that was was a budget. Yeah, um, um, that had money in it. A, no, quite. I just did a documentary um, with with Forrest, my assistant, um, and we did it together. And there was no budget. Um, and in fact, we probably we but we got some players on it, and we spent some money. And in fact, we did what all of us have done. We spent we spent more than we had because we, you know, especially for Forrest, wanted to be a to have um have a good sound for, for, for his reel. He's a really talented guy and get, get his music out there. And we've all done that before. Um, but you can't do that for a living, can you? You know, it's not no. all about getting a good demo reel <laughs> together. Well, I think some things don't change. This is something I've, I really struggle with um, is just is just trying to encourage people to, to be themselves and not to try and imitate others. And I know that when I came to you with some library stuff, you know, uh, you were very much... Don't do that because he's good at that. Uh, you you do some original, d different stuff that's a little bit more. You grew up in Labrick Grove, so bring that to the the table. Definitely, if in your case it was definitely like, well, I could hear what what your strengths were, so let's hear a bit more of that. And yeah. that's obviously what one's got to do. I think one's got to do that not just with library music. I mean, just 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 with with any sort of composition. You you have to play to your strengths. I mean, if you you know, I've, when people send me demos and they I can hear that they're a good singer, but they don't use it. I just think what a waste. You know, yeah. if I was a good if I was such a good singer, I'd do it. You know, I, in in this room, I've got all sorts of instruments that I play really badly, but you know, because I can pick it up, I can use it. You got to use it. Yeah. Um, and um, and so you've, but having said that, with with the library music, I, I, I isn't it wasn't that the it wasn't that the the thing in the eighties and nineties was okay. So we need some chamber music that sounds nineteenth century. So that's what you did. So yes, you, 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 that's what you did. But there's such a, a wreath of that now. You don't uh, you don't need to. So so there's room for for original content. I think what's changed so radically from when you and I were working together, or I was working for for, for you back in the day, was the big thing was uh, it, let's not make it sound like library music. I mean that's not a thing now. That is exactly the thing. But hang on, but isn't that the same with everything with filmmaking and with um, uh, you know you don't want it to you everybody's looking for originality everyone's yes. looking for an angle um to to cut through is something new i mean and so at the beginning you you're you're trying your 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 hand at uh, at other people's sounds and then finding finding your own but i mean it's a bit much to ask that i've asked that of what uh 60 composers 70 100 maybe 100 composers when they with library music and i've just sort of said okay so this is what they did do then it was really really effective you know a ukulele some bells critales and an upright bass but that's not hip anymore. So what are they doing now? And then the poor guy goes off with his tail between his legs. And, you know, of course, you know, it, it, it was born, that style was born from something that happened in American culture and it hit off from, you know, a, a film, a little indie film and, you know, little Miss Sunshine or whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's very difficult for people, but if you can, if you can get the juices going and sort of saying, but really, what are you good at? You play the violin really well, but you actually program beats. If you program beats and they suck, don't do it. You know? No, <laughs> you know, absolutely. Get someone else to do them for you. I don't know. I've worked with a few uh, up and coming composers who are really good guitarists and they'll play me their stuff and it'd be full of like massive orchestral ostinatos. And you just want to grab their heads and go, look, look at all of those guitars. I can't play the guitar. I'm so jealous of you. Whilst, you know, our 
ears are tuned to these things and we can tell the difference between Bach and Bartok, really, for most punters, directors, once they're onto their second orchestral CD, it just all sounds the same. Exactly. Everyone always should be pushed to sort of find their own voice. And that, again, is very hard uh, to do. And I wouldn't profess to be... Um, to have found my own voice yet, and I probably never will. But um, but if you but the, there's nothing better than hearing a, a, a film score or or a film score artist composer who has something about them that is different from other people. Thing I've uh, the lo- things that have changed musically and score writing over the last twenty years. I I love some of the scores that actually aren't pe- people who can't write or have not no training of, in in orchestral composition, but somehow. There's some real charm and clunkiness to their writing. Yeah. I, I was going to name a couple, but that would have been really, <laughs> really rude. Yeah, really. So and so, he's skull. a bit. I love. Oh, I love I? how clunky he, he is. <laughs> it reminds me of a very famous uh, music supervisor saying to me once, uh, and this was a a film that I took over from Dario Marianelli. And it was one of the few cues that I actually wrote. And he said, you know, what's brilliant I about it. what... I remember this music supervisor saying to me, what's brilliant about what you've done with this cue, Christian, is it makes me feel absolutely nothing. And it's, <laughs> well, you know, never write, going to be writing a point. neutral music, is a, there's a skill to that. <laughs> that's that's what we aspire to. <laughs> you, you obviously nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Rupert, thanks for sticking around for the duration of this episode. Moving on now to the film of the week, Scorsese's black and white masterpiece, Raging Bull, featuring probably what would be described as a career defining performance from Robert De Niro, who put something like seven stone on for the role. There was a four month hiatus between the very ripped Robert De Niro as the boxer, all the way to the somewhat sadder and certainly fatter shadow of his former self, just for a few minutes at the very beginning and end of the film. And I feel very guilty here, Anna, because last week, you know, Gary and I got to escape into the childlike universe of Star Wars. This week, we're going back to a very dark place, Anna. Sorry about that. What did you make of it? When you um, sent me a message saying, would you be up for coming on again? And this, and I said, yes, absolutely. Um, I really enjoyed it last time. And then, and then it said, oh, it's Raging Bull. It's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> no, I thought, um, I watched it last night and wow, it's, I mean, it's brutal, but it's, but again, it's it's not just about one thing, is it? It's it's all encompassing, and it's. Have you ever been to a boxing match, by the way? No, but I think you're going to tell me about performing at one. So when my first daughter was very little, in fact, she was I think she was eight months old. Um, I got offered um, a gig playing um, performing at a boxing match, and it's um, Vladimir Klitschko, who's like one of the biggest heavyweight champions in the world. So his wife. And he was running for, I think he was running for office, like for, he's a Ukrainian uh, uh, politician, as well as being a a heavyweight champion. And um, his wife was one of those musicians, models type person. She'd released a single. And so the whole idea was like violinists playing um, just before the boxing match, um, playing, playing, uh, playing her piece with her. So, and I took my daughter because uh, I traveled everywhere with her. So I was, she was in a sling. we get to this, this, this is in Moscow, so flying out to Moscow to a boxing match full of 10,000 Wayne Rooney lookalikes. Actually, with your new haircut, you'd have fit, <laughs> you'd have fit right in. Um, <laughs> so, and, um, and the brutality, I mean, I fir- first of all, I, I love a bit of theatre, and, and it's theatre. The, once the, the, f- the fight starts, it's the, the sound, the brutality, of the, like the whacking of the skin and the bone and the muscle. And I just remember, I was actually breastfeeding my daughter, surrounded by these 10,000 Wayne Rooney lookalikes. And at one point the blood was like just dripping down the sweat. You, you, like it flings at your face. I was only in about like the third row or something. And I had wow. to leave because it was too brutal. I was like, this is such a weird thing. Men, this rage and this violence, but it's controlled and then focused in. And I thought the film did it so, it was so brutal and so visceral. One shot that I, that I sent you where he, he gets punched and you see the psh, the kind of blood and stuff, you know, spraying onto the front row. That is what it's like. And I felt you can, like, in the film, you can smell it. The cinematography is beautiful, but very violent. That's, I felt like I was yes. there again. It took me back. Uh, it's one of these movies that you. I dread kind of watching it because it is definitely my top five. And you dread watching it because you, th- you think, oh, is it going to have dated awfully? But, it, boy, it hasn't. And um, to take you right into the heart of 
you know, a man who is deeply violent and deeply obsessive and jealous and, and, and full of rage, you kind of feel that right from the very beginning. The, the one thing that, that I don't, that I don't understand, and obviously it's the, the, the underage women or the portrayal of, of girls, being, that, that when the DA comes and they, and they show the two photos of the 14 year old who obviously doesn't look like a 14 year old in the bar, but at the same time he knows she's under 21, but maybe not quite as young as 14. I, I wasn't sure what, the, what Scorsese meant. There's that lingering shot of the two photos. And I wasn't sure whether he's trying to, to make us understand, oh, how easily these men can be deceived by these 14 year olds who yeah. look grown up. Or is he saying, she's a 14 year old, you know, you've taken someone's innocence or you've, 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 you've colluded in, in taking someone's innocence and, and, you know, done something illegal. I, I wasn't, that was the only moment where, and I felt uncomfortable all throughout, but it definitely doesn't depict um, domestic violence in a, in a glorified way. It's not a comfortable, it's not a comfortable narrative, in mean, domestic violence narrative. But it was just in that one picture, I wasn't sure whose side Scorsese is on, like who his viewpoint yes. is. Are we meant to feel sorry for him that he's been sort of almost honey trapped by a 14 year old? I mean, I, I don't know, what do you, what do you think? No, no I, I think, think you're absolutely right. right. Because I remember watching it kind of pretty much soon after it came out. out. And I remember, and I remember feeling that way. way. Um, and, and I, I think, think that's, 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 that's the feeling he's trying to manipulate. And, and I think that, that, again, represents how opinions... You know, we used to use the, the, people, the term jailbait. It used to be quite common, yeah. place, yeah. acceptable. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's unacceptable. Yeah. But it's, uh, it is that this... Um, I think it's something I did, did want to bring up, and I didn't mention last week with Gary. It's the last two films had, in fact, been edited by women. Um, oh, really? a, the first three of the Star Wars series, I believe, were edited by Marcia Lu uh, Lucas, um, a woman who became George Lucas's wife and left him because of his workaholism, and also worked with Scorsese, I think, on the first couple of films that Scorsese did. And this is Thelma Shoemaker, and, or Schumacher, and um, this film has been voted, I think, by the, is it Directors Guild of America, or something like that, as the greatest feat of editing in film ever, and that was like in 2010. Uh, yeah, I mean, I absolutely think it definitely stands up, and, and, and I think it was actually came, I think it came out on the 20th of February, 1981, which is two days after I was born, and I don't look at that now, you know, 39 years later, and think, that it feels dated and it doesn't feel of the 80s and I know it's set in the 40s but it doesn't quite feel from the 40s either I think it is a timeless piece of cinema and I think it's yeah. I think it's the ingenuity in I mean the story is great and also you know the mental illness aspect it just stands the test of time but I think yeah I think you're right it's the editing I think is is the most genius bit of the of the filmmaking I think I have to be honest here, I was nervous about looking at Raging Bull. It's always been very much in the high top fives of my favourite films of all time. And every time I go back to it, I'm nervous that it's going to suddenly have dated really badly and become unwatchable. I don't think that is the case, though, with this film. It is a true masterpiece. Rupert, have you always been a fan of this film? And, and how do you think it holds up? I am a fan, and it is really strong. And... Uh... To be honest with you, when I first saw it, I think I was 15 and I, I tried to get into an X uh, on, I don't know, on the King's Road, an X, and they, I couldn't get into the X that I wanted to go and see, X as in an R-rated film. And uh, and so I went up the road and Raging Bull was on, went in and saw that. And I'd love to be artistic and creative and, and lovely and sort of say it just it moved me to tears. Actually, I was really pissed off that I hadn't seen the X down the, <laughs> down the road. Um, but... In my adult life, I've, I, it, it is, it's a wonderful film. And I think uh, Scorsese, I, I, I did a little bit of reading on him about it just because, um, well, it was just interesting. He was at the, at the stage in his life where, I mean, he was expecting it to be his last film. He was seriously tormented and De, De Niro had, had his issues. And it kind of, it, it's almost like you can tell that Marty Scorsese would kind of felt that it was going to be his last because he's trying everything you know there's lots of great great moves lots of really really nice subtle changes of speed which i love just at the right moment changes of speed as in uh shutter speed and what have you um and uh i guess you know that if you if you were a critic at the time you might have thought well you know rocky got, can't be like rocky so let's make it black and white uh um 
don't know what the score has got to be, but I like this bit of music, so I'll try this out. You know, there's a little bit of that, but that's everything that Scorsese did through his whole career was same as Kubrick, you know, find a piece of emotional music that really moves him and actually can be used for, you know, great that opening titles, it has the grace, and then it uses the same intermezzo for rage and then we kind of then we use it at the end and we sort of feel pity so it's it's really odd how how that that's amazing you wouldn't write if you were asked to write an emotional piece to describe uh grace and then rage and then pity you wouldn't write the same emotional piece would you but it, no. <laughs> it works you know um so yeah i think it's a it's a masterpiece but i'm sure it has its issues if as a as a film scholar you could pick apart some of the some of the storytelling but some of it is really it's incredible yeah and when you say he felt it was it, because I, I read that he was really kind of unwell and not looking after himself was it like that aspect of it maybe his last film or more that he just didn't feel he had a career ahead of him i think that he was a, he was at rock bottom i mean i you know i haven't asked him myself this is just <laughs> what i've read <laughs> um but i i i read that he he had been really sick and uh and just and and really felt that he wasn't going to make another movie and was probably moving on to other pastures. And De Niro brought the book and uh, and, and persuaded him to, to do it. I wonder wh whether these great films that don't have scores, whether, I mean, for instance, 2001, uh, as we know, the score was sacked and it was replaced with with all sorts of Ligeti and, and Strauss and what have you. But I wonder when he first started post-production, whether he was wanting a score, and I wonder whether Marty Scarf's Scorsese, I'd love to ask him, whether he actually started off wanting to have the score but just couldn't find the right composer or or, or bottled it, didn't couldn't didn't want to be able to have to communicate with with the composer because that, as we know, is a really personal thing. And some people get very tortured by talking to people. And if he was in that state of mind, he might not order to to try and communicate and let his film go to some composer. Um or maybe he just found that one piece of music in a Tarantino type of way, like I'm gonna pivot the whole film around this piece of music because it moves me you know interesting to know which way it was i think what i found fascinating um is is just trying to recontextualize uh those the first use of those kind of camera moves that he was a combination of camera moves and and, and editing that mm. really i mean i remember it really coming full force when he did like color of money and and, and it was like really a, like camera moves that you noticed that I think inspired the likes of the Coen brothers all the way to, to kind of Guy, Guy Ritchie, who did it with on, on yeah. acid. And it was just, it was great to see the, the, the birth of those kind of, th those techniques, really. Yeah, to just, I mean, to use, it's a bit cliched now, because like you say, everybody's used it. Great film um, writers of, uh, directors rather, have, have used it since, but just from a very, from quite an emotional and soft um, um scene to be interrupted by a smack in the face and blood spurting and th those sort of moves are used all the time now but that's quite brutal and he used that quite a few times and i mean obviously the performances are are quite incredible um and i i think what's very very interesting about it is there's there's nothing to like about this man at all but yet mm. i'm sure we wouldn't make it to the end if we didn't give a monkeys about him. And I wonder how important Joe Pesci's role um, is in making us like him, because there is a bit of love there. Certainly, it's, it's pretty one directional for Joe Pesci for his brother. But I wonder if that that character is very important to help us along there. No, I agree. I agree. And and it's sort of heartbreaking in the end, because you because you say it's a one directional love, but actually it's gone completely. And yes. when you see it's gone, it's really it's really heartbreaking. Um, and so in that case, like you say, you you do care. You he's made us care somehow. There's something special about them, and especially special about their relationship and the three of them, uh, Marty Scorsese and, and De Niro, and uh, they 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 just went on. And on they did, Rupert, Goodfellas, Casino, even last year's The Irishman. It's great to see the birthplace of that fantastic collaborative trio. Right, onwards from the visceral energy of the boxing ring and to the dynamic forces of the sea with Benjamin Britten's Sea Interludes, which are taken from his seminal opera, 
Peter Grimes. Are you a fan of Britain? I've got a mixed relationship with Britain. Um, I did... At school, I did the play Noise Floody. Uh, I did it at least twice. I might have even done it three times, and I really didn't like it at all. I just, just it didn't get on with it at all. Um, but I did sing the Ceremony of Carols um, on various tours around the, 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 the world as a chorister, and I love that. And that was the first time I really liked Benjamin Britten. I had a strange relationship with his with his harmonies. I didn't really get them in Noise Flood. I just didn't. I just it didn't do it for me. But Peter Grimes is uh, that is a different thing altogether. The, the, he's there's something special. that's special about it. And then and the serenades are 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 very special. And I think harmonically, I don't. I'm I'm afraid I I can't be a professor on this. But harmonically, it just feels it's not that it's not that it's unsurprising or that it's uh, that it's obvious. And so I feel comfortable because I feel very uncomfortable in some places, which is what he's trying to make you feel. Yeah. But I understand what he's written. <laughs> you know, I understand it. Yeah. Whereas in some of his earlier works, I just, I didn't, un I didn't understand it. And so it didn't move me. And, uh, you know, it's just stupid. I'm just stupid. You know? no, no. But these are, these, these are wonderful. I mean, they, and when they upset you, they upset you for all the right reasons. And, uh, and you can sort of see uh, that the dawn, the dawn, a morning dawn, the, yeah, the, the yeah. first one, it kind of, uh, when I first heard it, I thought that it, uh, I thought it was a wonderful piece of film music, but it's not, but it felt like film music. And then halfway through it suddenly becomes like Dirty Harry is running across a rooftop. It suddenly becomes Lala Schifrin. Yeah. Uh, which I found really, really interesting and a bit San Francisco groovy, you know. I was really surprised at how many kind of movie score tropes for want of the better, better word that I, I heard in there it was interesting a few weeks ago we were looking at the parallax view and there are some deaf i mean absolute quotes of the sea interludes in the score to the parallax view but moments in it which sound you know uh, uh highly contemporary that that the high string and flute line at the very beginning and, and all of that and then the the storm the last one um that and it's sort of rhythmic off kilter, I don't know what it is. It's kind of three. It's in three, four, three, four, five, four, something, and so it knocks about all the accents. It's kind of it, it could be a a classy Marvel score. It could be. I mean, we know how classy Alan Silvestri is on his own. He doesn't need Benjamin Britten, but um, but it's it's really good and 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 dark. And so, for someone who lives by the sea. A good soundtrack for your morning walk, Anna? This morning I thought, oh, you know, it's, it, there, I think it's 16 minutes in total, isn't it? Or 16, 17 minutes. I put my headphones on, went for a walk this morning about 8 o'clock in the morning, down to the sea. And this is out of context of Peter Grimes, because now I've read up on the story. And obviously in that setting, it makes total sense. But taken on their own, watching the sea, I was a bit like, a bit like that whiplash, like, it's, it's not my sea, it's not my tempo. Like I felt actually, <laughs> I mean, I love Benjamin Britten, but I was kind of getting a bit frustrated, I have to say. It's probably not what you, <laughs> what you want to hear, no, no. but the dawn, it's way too busy. I mean, I love it. The yeah. horn writing is incredible. The flute, you know, the, 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 the wind, woodwind, but I mean, there's so much going on. And anyone who's watched dawn over the sea rise over the sea, I mean, he must have done an old bra, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not, this is totally subjective. <laughs> when you read it in the context of what the, um, what the opera is about, it totally then made sense for me again. And he's right. actually taken someone who's a monster, this, the, this fisherman who's a monster, and he's actually created a more sympathetic character, going back to Raging Bull. It's like the idea of this sympathetic fisherman that you, um, that you can empathise with rather than just the monster. So, in the context of that, I totally think it's amazing but in the context of me walking down and do I hear the sea no <laughs> well I think but it's an interesting point Anna it's also just it, it it marks what how our relationship with nature has changed where uh, uh you know in those days it was about conquering whereas now as city folk who spend a lot of time in front of screens the reason we go to the sea is to get away from conquering and 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 all of those i don't know if you you know this you know um, martin phipps the 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 tv composer so um he is um he's actually the god godson of benjamin Britten. so so yesterday when you asked me to come and talk about um the, the sea interludes I actually i actually phoned him i said have you got any have you got any insider knowledge that i should know about benjamin Britten? but he 
Um, he says that he used to walk down the beach and he would hear all the music. He would write, he would walk and hear everything in his head, the whole orchestration, and then come home and then write it all out. Um, and, but it was literally from the sea that he did get his inspiration, not only for this, but just generally, that he spent a lot of time on the, on the Suffolk coast. I must let you get back to your sea because it looks very hot where you are. You know, is it, is I'm it really, really sweating. <laughs> I need to Summer get some here. air con or something. Yeah, open the doors. And I'm, I'm actually going to go for a quick dip in the, in the sea right now. Oh, good for you. You take care, Anna. Thank take you care. so much. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Bye. Bye, bye. I've linked Anna's website down below. Do check out what she's up to. Absolutely amazing work. And Rupert, before I let you go, I just wanted to return to the conversation we're having about relationships. And something we both have in common is we both have brothers who are also successful composers. And I see that you and Harry have actually just finished working together. We've been talking about it. Uh, in and out, sometimes we really didn't want to work with each other at all over the years, of course, because we're brothers. But uh, but um, we we had been talking about it for a while. And then this thing came up um, and I asked him to do it with me. I just sort of said, OK, well, this is perfect. Uh, and, and it kind of was perfect um, because we had a lot of fun doing it. Having said that, I was coming and going from the UK, from L.A. quite a lot. So we got to write thematics at the beginning together at his place. And then I came back to England. And by the time we'd sort of got the themes, we were in different countries, different, you know. Right. But uh, it was good. I mean, we, we, we were talking with each other afterwards. I mean, you know, Harry, you, you've met Harry. Harry has got many more words. He's much more articulate. He's, 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 he's lively. He's fun. All the things that, 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 that I struggle with. And uh, so we do interviews together. And, uh, and of course, you know, I'd sort of wait for question nine to answer and that would be the last one but that that was just that has probably been our relationship since since the beginning so joe and i d worked on a very big computer game together and it was it was just very interesting because and there was a third writer as well his partner alexis and it, it, it's great because there's a, a real like i mean it's not even shorthand it's like it's it's literally dna that gets you <laughs> makes you cut to the chase but that, that's not without its problems. I felt personally, I'm not speaking and projecting onto you that you had to do the same, but I felt there was a little bit of rebuilding as brothers that had to happen after the, 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 the cut and chase of, of, of composing together. Well, Harry and I, very typical in our relationship, we, had, we started and then we did have, within about a week, we had, there the, 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 the became a moment where the, where the, where the lines just, would, the, the battle lines were drawn and it was like, okay, <laughs> so we, we had it out and um and not that we're always this mature but 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 after after that everything was great and it was fine and we found, we actually found that there were areas where you know we were more suitable than 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 the other and so so there wasn't a problem but we did we had a, we did have an issue but you know firstly we're brothers secondly you know we've we've always had that sort of fun but fiery relationship and um and also it was the first, I mean, I, I, I have a team where that work with me, but you know, I'm, I'm always there as the, as the, as the, the, the person pushing things forward where I hadn't really done collaboration for, for years, you know, yeah. and the collaborations, collaborations I did with hands over the years, you know, of course, you know, he's always been my mentor. So I kind of always gave him great respect. Um, so it was interesting, but I'm glad you're still talking to Joe. Knowing you two as I do, you 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 both are very different musically. So did you not just complement each other, just like icing and marzipan? Yes. So the differences were great artistically. Um, the uh, uh, the the differences in work approach were not great. <laughs> uh, Joe won't mind me talking about this, but I'm just I'm an absolute procrastinate last minuter, and Joe Joe's uh, loves to just chip away. And, 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 and needs to feel every day that, that something has been achieved. Whereas I only work well under pressure. And if pressure is not being applied, I simply apply it to myself. I don't know if that's something you relate to at all. I can totally relate to that. Um, I have changed my ways. I used to be um, a chipper away. And, you know, I used to do horrible, horrible long nights and days. For, for years I did that. But uh, now I'm much more, I think about it a lot more before I act, which could be put down as procrastination, but I'll just call it... Um, preparation. Little yes, preparation. Yes, it's another P word. But I, um, yeah. 
no i i can do i can i can see that and but that's very difficult if let's say you two are writing the same cue together you're doing the you're doing the harmonies he's doing the melody i mean if you're procrastinating and he's chipping away i don't know how that works no um <laughs> but um yeah well i'm glad we're still talking to our to our brothers rupert thank you so much for for um uh, joining me today and it's i do hope we can have that beer it's so long overdue i know in in a country it's probably going to be bournemouth at this rate but uh it could be any country you like fantastic rupert thank you so much mate Good to meet you. cheers all right see you mate i'm sure it goes from all of us that we're really appreciative of rupert's anna's time uh, this week so who's going to be turning up next week well not only a fantastic composer in his own right, but also a trailblazer of a particular form of EDM. It's going to get deep. I can just feel it. And the film that he's picked for next week is John Carpenter's Escape from New York. And instead of honing in on a single piece of music next week, why don't we all swat up on John Carpenter's extraordinary film scoring portfolio? Right, Last but by no means least, if you recall last week, I was having difficulty downloading a new free analog library. We've rectified that. Over to you, Kellen. So as promised, here is Katie Richardson's Evergreen Voyager. <laughs> So other than the kind of reverbs, different reverbs, we've got Stairwell. Amazing. We've also got these Mooga Fuga uh, signals. So let's have a listen to these. alongside a whole host of synthesizers. Next up is a special gift from our friends at Bunker Samples, the Danbo Pad. I have lived in Vietnam on and off since 2013 and have always had a deep fascination with traditional Vietnamese instruments. I have an ever-growing collection of Vietnamese instruments and the Danbo is my favorite of them all. It's a monochord and is traditionally played by plucking the string with a long bamboo pick while stopping it at a natural harmonic with the palm of your hand. Absolutely beautiful. If you don't know Bunker Samples, do check them out linked below. One of my favourite sample developers, really affordable. This pad, thank you so much for providing this for the Piano Book community to use for free, but also amazing GUI, lovely thing to have upon your desktop. And there's a great video here further explaining what a Danbo is and what he did to make this instrument. Next we have Sacha Denens, and sorry if I'm saying that wrong, the Lockdown Mandolin. He writes, I picked this Havana 8-string mandolin a year back, just before a recording session. Ever since then, I wanted to sample this mandolin and finally sat down a week back to do that, thanks to the mandatory COVID-19 lockdown phase here in India. I think we can all relate to a bit of lockdown sampling. Instantly, I can hear that you've gone for the idiosyncrasies, the imperfections. Not every note is identical. This is what brings samples to life, brings us realism. But also, this gives it a point. Uh, it has your soul, your life, your character, your performance and the character of the instrument. Pierre Caillet has given us this wonderful confinement Celeste, sampled by his friend Jan Volsi. What a beautiful gem. So much character, something I know people are going to get so much really happy use out of. And lastly, Dora Dore, again, sorry about the names, gives us the Mason and Hamlin Model A. My father passed away earlier this year. Uh, I'm so sorry to hear that. 
We were lucky enough to have a funeral before the lockdown, but because of it, all of us are sheltered at home, cannot go to his house to sort through the family belongings. In his house, there's an A.B. Chase baby grand piano that I learned to play on. It's out of tune and needs a total overhaul, and we fear it will end up in the junk heap, as not many pianos from the golden age are being restored unless they have Steinway written on them. I didn't realize that I had a connection to that instrument until last year, after I bought a restored 1928 Mason and Hamlin Model A. This is going to be a piano book classic, I feel. Not only have you captured the beautiful kind of grandeur of the instrument with that lovely natural tuning, but also I'm now transported, and that is very welcome, from this shed into the room where this piano resides. So congratulations to you. It's a triumph. so much for sticking to the end do subscribe if you haven't done already and ding that bell to be notified the next time i put a video up one of those for this week's contributors joe rupert anna and of course yourselves for putting stuff up using the handle nerding for the weekend i'll continue keeping a beady eye on what nerditry you've been getting up to lots of love to you all stay safe and see you very soon <laughs>